right, so we're here to talk about extreme prayers today, and uh, uh, we are in week five of a series, taking a break for a moment to hear Grundy Mountain Mission Choir. Uh, it was great to have them here and to be blessed by them. Um, and now we're back into talking about extreme prayers, and today we're talking about being specific in our prayers. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, to help me uh, a little bit with some of these short, pithy kind of slogan statements that we say. I'm going to say the first part, and if you know the second part, be, you're welcome to join in, okay? This first one, I did not know, but first service, obviously, they knew all of it. We'll see how well you do. Here you go. Ready? A miss is as good as a mile. I, I had not heard that one. A miss is good as a mile. I suppose that's like hand grenades and horseshoes. I don't know. A miss is as good as a mile. Here's another one. The early bird. Okay, I know that one. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Absence makes the heart yeah don't put all of your eggs in one basket and then here's my favorite one red robin i know it's not one of those slogans written down in the books of annals of time but it needs to be it needs to be um just thought i would try there's another <laughs> another pithy statement that I, I would love to write out for you here um that is going to be our topic of discussion so I use my magic pen here to uh, write it for you. And then I do another destructive thing in a moment. All right, here's the message. Everybody got it? All right, we're going to help. The devil dust is coming out. Satan sprinkles. Hey, I tried to pull in here and it didn't work. I can certainly do glitter now. I'll have to clean up my own mess. Here it is. This is that short, pithy statement that you couldn't see before. I hope you can see now. Not quite. Have faith in God. Right there it is. And I'm going to have glitter on everything now. And every time I have a little piece of glitter, and somebody says, you have glitter on your face, so it's because I have faith in God. Reality is, faith is something we cannot see. And yet we still have it. We have faith in God that he did what he said he would do and he would do it the way he said he would do it. And one of those things he asks us to do in faith is to pray. Like we're speaking to an invisible God who's not physically present with the idea that he's hearing us. You're weird. Why would you do such a thing? Well, actually... Because in faith, our God asks us to. And so we're going to look at how faith in God will do that for us. Look at uh, Colossians chapter 4 with me. These are Paul's words. We've read this little text before, and I share it again because there is a specific prayer that's listed uh, that I wanted to share with you as well. First part of uh, Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4 is what I'm looking at. It reads this way. Devote yourselves to prayer. Now, I, I don't know how much you want to underline the word devote yourselves, but devote yourselves to prayer. Uh, when, we, when we have texts that say pray without ceasing, and then we read texts like this, devote yourself to prayer, don't you think it's something we're supposed to do? All right, now, it's just kind of a have faith in God, devote yourself to prayer moment. But then it says being watchful and thankful, and here's where he gets specific. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. He's very specific. Now, devote yourself in prayer. Shotgun. Boom. Pray. And then pray this way. Pray specifically this way. Now, the real text that we're looking at, not the real text, the another text we're looking at today uh, in regards to uh, where I want to go today would be in Mark chapter 11. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time. So I got that one over so that you keep your hand right in Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, verse 12. Several things are going on in this text, and I don't have time to unpack all of what's happening in this text. We're just going to look at the last portion of it. But I want you to hear all of it because I think it's important to how the story unfolds. So verse 12, uh, verse 12, Jesus clears the temple. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Stop for a moment. Jesus, God, man, hungry. Anybody who wants to have a question about it, he was God and man. Jesus was hungry. Stop. Verse 13. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. 
And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. Now, here's something that you don't want Jesus to say about your life. This is something you don't want to have Jesus say about your life. May no one ever eat fruit from you again. Not good. And his disciples heard him say it. And on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught, he said this. It is not written. My house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. A house of prayer. But you've made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and they began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. In the morning, they went along and they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. People remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Now, let's just be clear. When Jesus says, you're not going to bear any fruit anymore, we're not going to wait around for that moment to happen. It's going to stop happening at that moment, all right? So it's done. But then we look on. Have faith in God. That's what Jesus answered. Have faith in God. I tell you the truth that if anyone says to this mountain, go and throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. And therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your father in heaven may forgive your sins. That last verse in itself is a whole sermon by itself. Like how in the world are we bouncing our prayers off the ceiling? Is there anybody that we need to forgive? Is there anybody that we need to forgive? A little short notice about figs uh, for a moment, a sideline moment about figs in the the looking up of this text. There is a proverb that sometimes said, uh, I'm sitting underneath my fig tree. If you said, I am sitting underneath my fig tree, it meant you were a prosperous person because fig trees uh, grew figs three times a year. So if you were under your fig tree, it meant you were just sitting there in the shade, popping some figs, and doing life good. Like you're doing a prosperous life if you're sitting under your fig tree. Uh, There's nothing really important about that other than I just wanted to tell you that I found that information. So it's not really anything about the sermon, but I thought it was cool. So going on, we're talking about extreme prayers. And there's something to be said about connecting the fact that when we don't bear fruit, and our prayers kind of get connected. You want to know if you're bearing fruit? How are you praying? Just start there. I want to say that sometimes bearing fruit means you're actually producing more of whatever it is in your life. That's good. But what are you producing in prayer that would show that you are doing anything significant? (laughs) So here's some things about having faith in prayer. When we have faith in prayer and we have faith in God prayers, here's some things that it means. First off, it means that we submit to his will and not our own. Now, this is always some of the hardest parts of teaching about prayer, because when we pray, we want to treat it like it's a Santa Claus moment, and we pray it, and we expect him to answer. Got it. And you're going to hear more about that, but the reality is, whenever we start to think about specific prayers, we want instantaneous results. But I have to tell you, it's not about your will. It's about his And so many times we want it to be about our will. But I wanted that, God, and you didn't answer my prayer. And so we get mad at him. He knows better than us. And so we're going to live under his will. And we're going to put faith in God. Verse 22 tells us that we need to have faith in God. That actually means translated constantly trusting in God. Constantly trusting in God. In other words, he's got it. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's up to. I know what I want, but he knows better than me. And we're going to let him do that. That even if we had faith as small as a mustard seed, we could move mountains if our small faith is placed in a big God. Is your small faith in a big God? 
Or do you have big faith in a small God? I have faith that he'll do it, but he's really not as big as he lets himself out to be. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says it this way, And this is the confidence we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Do you hear that part? According to his will. According to his will. We, we ask according to his will, not according to our wants. And the main issue is not what I want, but what God wants for me. It's not what I want, it's what he wants Jesus himself gives us the model prayer in Luke chapter 22, verse 42. When he's praying in the garden, he says, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Power not in the person praying, but in the one to whom we are praying to. Man, we get caught up in who's going to say a special prayer over somebody. We can't eat until the preacher gets here because he's going to lift up the prayer so we can eat. So don't touch anything yet. What are you talking about? Somebody pray and get it over with. Let's go. We're all allowed to go inside the curtain now. There aren't special people that get to go in there and talk to God. We're all allowed to go in. Curtain curtain veil, torn top to bottom at crucifixion. We all get to go in. No no special prayers. No special praying people. We formulate our request to God. And whenever we do, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And believes in his heart, it will come to pass, it will be done. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer... Believe that you received it, and it'll be yours. Notice all in the first part of the prayer is uh, whoever, whoever prays, no matter who you are, what you've been through, how long you've been going to church, how much of a Christ follower you are, and how much you have claimed to be saved, the reality is whoever can talk to me, whoever. But then there's a second part, and we don't want to miss that, and that is a whatever in that same text. Whatever. There's no circumstances or situations where prayer is not profitable. Think of, think of something that you have right now and just go, oh, that's not worthy of prayer. What are you talking about? Everything is worthy of talking to him about. Let me just help you out with this one. You have a girlfriend, a wife, somebody that you really care about, you're going to want to spend time talking to them. And you're not going to spend time talking to them about the same things. You're going to want to talk about more things. You're going to want to talk about specific things. And you're going to get, get more and more in a deeper relationship. And the reality is that's how we are with God in our prayer life. We're either going to do it or not. Do we want to be in a relationship or don't we? That's really the question. Do you want to be in a relationship with God? Why don't you talk with him? A failed marriage, a bad relationship, probably because you're not talking very well. Your family not getting along right now, probably because you're not talking very well. You talk better to God, things kind of work out. It's a better relationship. Because God is in charge of the impossible. Why is he in charge of it? Because God says in Jeremiah 32 verse 17, wrong in your bulletin. 32 17 says, is there anything too hard for me? Can you picture this? God looks at us and he says, go ahead and give me something that's really difficult. He's almost taunting us. Is there anything too hard for me that I can't handle? Anything you haven't thought of specifically that I can't deal with? Go ahead. Give it a try. Try me out. There's nothing that's too hard for me to take care of. Because nothing is impossible for God. Luke chapter 1 verse 37. Truly I say to you for nothing will be impossible with God. We must therefore be bold in our prayers. For the potential of prayer is unlimited as much as it is in our own spirit. Here's a second thing that happens though. Whenever we find ourselves having faith in God. And we have faith in God kind of prayers. It means God's power gets released. Now when we pray we need to act like God is already answering our prayer. You know, like, while you're speaking it, he's going to answer it. Now, that's the opposite of what I just said to you, right? Like, uh, the Santa Claus prayer is, hey, I want this, and I want it now, and he gives it to you, right? No, you're praying, believing that he's going to answer it as you're saying it. Not when, just that he will, that he's going to answer it. Whatever you ask in prayer, believe, and you will have received it, and it will be yours. The thing about faith is you've got to believe God before you can believe your prayer. And sometimes we don't believe God before we believe the prayer. Do we believe God knows what he's up to, what he can do, and that he's already beginning to answer the prayer? If you were to pray for rain, then you should carry an umbrella. And everybody's looking at you, even on a sunny day. Why are you carrying an umbrella? I prayed it was going to rain. And I believe it will happen. So I'm praying 
in advance of what I know is going to be happening. You'll be thinking, well, I prayed for something, but it didn't happen. God didn't answer my prayer. How can I have faith, Brian? Because God always answers prayer. Now, listen carefully. If we go back to point one, not necessarily the way we want it, okay? But God always answers prayer. Sometimes the answer is yes. You've heard this before. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is wait. And we hate waiting. And sometimes there's this extra one. The one I don't think we always think about. Sometimes God gives us something different or better than what we did or did not ask. Like, I never asked for that, God. Like, that wasn't even in the words that I said to you. But somehow you transformed what I said and gave me something completely different than what I asked for. That's because you know better than me. You know what I need better than I need. And so sometimes I have to believe without a doubt that God hears my prayers. James, in the book of James, gives admonition about praying in faith. He says, if you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Do you believe what it is you're saying? Some of you have heard about, uh, maybe, maybe you've heard about the great preacher George Mueller of Bristol. He was a great man of faith. George Mueller was on a steamship coming from England to America, and he was going to preach in New York City. Well, uh, they were immobilized in the ship for two to three days because there was this incredible amount of fog, and they couldn't go anywhere. So the captain just said, we're going to sit still, and we're going to wait for the fog to pass. George Mueller was realizing what was going on and that he might miss his speaking engagement and knew that God's word needed to be delivered to New York City. Who can't give me an amen on that? He needed to get to New York City and get the message of Christ there. So George went to the captain that he knew was a Christian and said, would you mind if we get this ship going? And he said, we can't. We might collide with rocks. We could hit another ship. We have to stay put until the fog is gone. And so Mueller said to the captain, Captain, would you be willing to go below with me and pray to God that he'll remove the fog? And he could tell by the amused expression on the captain's face, like, yeah, sure, we can go and pray about that. So he knows he doesn't really believe it, so he goes down and he gathers him up. He gets on his knees and he prays a prayer something like this, God, I really think that you want me to speak in New York City. And so I'm asking you to remove this fog so the ship can proceed. Thank you, God, that you've done this in Jesus' name. Then the captain, he began to pray, and George stopped him. He said, no, captain, you're not going to pray. Captain said, why not? Two reasons. Number one, you really don't believe God will remove the fog. And number two, I believe he already removed the fog. So they went back up on deck. On the, on the deck, and they saw that the fog had cleared away. They made their way going. George Mueller made his speaking engagement. And you could say, well, that's just a little story. Thanks for that little cute story, Brian. That never really happens. If you don't believe God's power can be released, it probably won't be. Can you believe that God's power will be released? Here's another thing. And having faith in God means that we need to pray specifically, which is really the topic of this discussion. How specific are we in our prayers, though? Because the more specific we come, the longer our prayers become. And I say, yes, that's a good thing. Again, go back to the relationship thing. The more specific I become with the person I love and I'm geared to, the more I'm going to talk about more stuff. I'm not going to just have the same conversations with them. And I'm certainly not going to just talk shotgun with them. Boom, let's just talk, whatever that is. I'm going to talk specifically about some things and get to the point of those things. Here's some things that we kind of shotgun on in regards to our prayers. God... Be with our missionaries. What? Like, do you know what missionaries have to deal with? And do you know that each mission is different than the next mission and what they've got going on? Like, the specific things that they need are incredible. How about this one? Oh, God, thank you for the food. 
Man, I want to be specific. Thank you, God, for butter. Thank you, God, for bacon. Thank you, God, for grilled meats. I mean, like, get specific. Peas with butter on them. Who can't have that? I mean, peas are boring without butter on them. You got to do something. Pray about the specific things that are happening in your world. Pray, then just, God, be with the food. Be with the stuff on my plate, the specific stuff on my plate. Thank you for allowing me to have it today. Sometimes we pray, God, would you heal the sick? <laughs> okay, I'll get started on that for you. Pray for the sick. Heal the sick. And then one of my favorites, God bless America. Really? What part of America do you want him to bless? It means that some things in America are cursed right now, right? Do you know what those things are? Why don't you ask him for that? God bless America. Don't get me wrong. It's a nice prayer. We put on a lot of bumper stickers. Everybody says it. Our president says it. God bless America. How do you want him to bless you? How? Be specific. Say it. My Aunt Blanche, when she would pray for Max, he had several heart surgeries going on in his life. And I walk in in the middle of whatever she had going on, and I think I'm coming to pray and be a good nephew or whatever. And she said, don't be worry. I've already prayed for the surgeon's fingers. I took hold of his hands before he met with my husband, and I said, God bless his fingers. When your fingers have been blessed, surgery's going to go well. Maybe we pray for stitches. Maybe we pray for antibodies. Maybe we pray for arteries to be cleared, specific arteries to be cleared. A mountain is a, an obstacle. It blocks your path. stops your progress. It blocks your view of God. So here's the question. Is there a challenge that you're faced with right now that looks to you like a mountain? It's a huge mountain. Maybe it's a financial mountain. And you pray it that way. God, I have a financial mountain. You put it on your prayer request. Have you ever thought of it this way? Have you ever prayed for $164.59 to arrive? You want to take care of a financial situation? Don't call it financial. I need $164.59 by Wednesday, God. And I know you can do it. I don't know how, but I know you can do it. That's a specific prayer of your financial problem. What about the, maybe a relational mountain? Your marriage is on the rocks. Maybe you need to pray specifically for a specific conversation that needs to take place between the two of you so that it won't be on the rocks anymore. Maybe you have some sort of relationship problem with someone, even within the church. It seems like an insurmountable problem. Maybe you're dealing with a physical mountain of sickness or illness or cancer or something. Would you tell God exactly what your fears are and what you want him to do about it? Don't just say, heal my sickness. What do you want healed in your sickness? Because healing your sickness sometimes means you could die. When you die, your sickness is healed. You don't have to worry about your, your sickness anymore. I'd be specific. I'd let God know exactly what it is I'm looking for here. Have a mountain? What mountain do you have? I say name it specifically. Give that mountain a name. Call it what it is. Say to the mountain what it is and give it a name. Label it. Speak right to it. And then when you speak to your mountain and you've given a name to it, you're going to tell the mountain to go someplace. And it's not going to be where it is right now. It's going to be someplace other than right in front of you. Helen Rosevier uh, was a missionary doctor in Zaire, Africa. One night she cited, uh, out of her best efforts, a mother died in childbirth that she was helping. And she left a premature baby and a crying two-year-old daughter. The clinic had no electricity, so there was no incubator. They kept the babies warm during the cold nights with hot water bottles. The only hot water bottle that they had burst due to dry rot as a nurse was filling it. And so they wrapped the baby in a blanket and a nurse stayed with the baby by the fire through the night. And by the grace of God, she survived that night. It would take a miracle for her to survive a second night. Each day, Helen gathered the children to pray and she told them about the two-year-old girl who was crying because her mother died and her baby sister who probably probably would be crying as well. But her sister would die because they didn't have a hot water bottle. Specifically, as prayer is a key, children don't have a problem praying specifically. A little girl named Ruth prayed bluntly, please God, send us a hot water bottle. Please send it today because the baby will be dead tomorrow and it'll be too late. And please, while you're at it, send the little girl a dolly so that she'll know that you love her too. 
Well, the prayer scared Helen. I mean, God can do everything. The Bible says so. But if he chose not to send the hot water bottle, how would she explain it to Ruth? Well, that afternoon, Helen received a 22-pound box from home. It was her first package in four years. It was exciting, but who sent a hot water bottle to Zaire, Africa? How many people think of an, an equator part of Africa getting cold at night? The children gathered around Helen, so they, she opened the box. She reached in, and she pulled out a lot of bright clothing for all of the children. She reached in again and pulled out lots of bandages for all of the leprosy patients. She reached in, and she pulled out a hot water bottle. And Helen began to cry. She'd been afraid to pray specifically for a hot water bottle to arrive that day. But Ruth jumped up and rushed toward the package. She cried, God sent the hot water bottle. He must have sent a dolly too. She rummaged around the box until she found it. A small, beautifully dressed doll. Five months earlier, Helen's former Sunday school class in England felt burdened to assemble a package for her. And someone felt like she should include a hot water bottle. She felt silly sending it to the equator, but she followed God's prompting, as only a Christian should do. And one woman's daughter wanted to give her a doll to an African child. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 24 is really key verse in regards to this whole message today. Isaiah 65, 24 says this, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. Before we've even uttered it, he's already working out a plan. And so I'm going to ask you to gather with a couple of people here in the next few minutes, and we're going to practice praying some praying things, okay? Three, four, five people, it doesn't matter, can circle around, turn around, whatever you need to do. Do that right now. Know who you're going to be with. Ready? Go. Get some partners. Go. You say, I'm going to talk to my spouse. That's fine. Talk to somebody else. I would talk to somebody else because it might include some other things you've not heard lately. And I would take the formula of active, A-C-T-I-V-E, okay? And we could spend a whole day doing this, and we're not going to. What I call popcorn prayers. And popcorn prayers are basically words or catchy phrases that we just say that come to our mind whenever we say this idea. And they're just going to be our prayers through words and, and, and going popcorn because it's just a lot of stuff all at one time. We're going to practice with the word A for adoration, somewhat simple. I want you to think of everything you can think of and the greatness of God that comes to mind and just popcorn out what it is that God is good at being adored about. Ready? Go. Okay, stop for time out, time out. That was adoration. Did you hear anything in the adoration prayers that you were not thinking of, but you were glad you heard? Anybody hear something? An adoration term. Okay, now I want you to move to Thanksgiving. Somewhat easy, we're not going to do confession, so don't worry about that one. We're going to try Thanksgiving right now when we think of thanking God for anything good that comes to mind. Anything good that comes to mind, I want you to be thankful to God. It's like Thanksgiving Day, what are you thankful for? You get ready to tell him. Ready, go. Okay, if we were going to do I, we would talk specifically names of people. We would say who it is that we come to mind. My, my aunt, my uncle, my dad, my dog, whoever. You would list them that way. We're going to skip past that. We're going to skip past V, which is vanquishing Satan. We would think of people and individual culture groups that need vanquishing of Satan. Maybe your own spirit. But we're going to move to E, and we're going to talk about extreme prayers. Extreme prayers are kingdom prayers. What are we looking more for? What do we want to see God do more of in the kingdom somehow, some way? What comes to mind? Ready? Go.
you know, on that one, I can't wait to find out what God's going to do. What you just suggested that God could do because you mentioned it, okay? That's all practicing popcorn prayer. Love popcorn praying because it's just an opportunity for you to just pop off what you're doing. You can do it in a circle, in a small group or whatever. Just do popcorn prayers. It's totally faster, too. You don't have to listen to the whole list of like, uh, you just have all that stuff going on. You just say bang, 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 and you can mention it, and then somebody pray, and you're done. It's awesome. Here's some specific prayers our elders are praying about in regards to our church. They listed them. They put them in the uplink. You've seen them. You've heard them. Here they are. They want to see an increased uh, uh, Fairfield uh, Church of Christ membership to 55 by September the 1st of 2019. 55 new members who weren't here before, who weren't a part of our church, coming and being a part of our church. That's until September. They gave a date. They gave a number. Uh, they want to see exceed, uh, us exceed in 2019 the FCC budget by 10%. In other words, $94,000 over what we should have is what they're praying for. We're going to have $94,000 more than what we're, we're supposed to have budgeted for the year. They're praying for that. Would you pray with them about that? Well, they are praying for an accumulated $750,000 by August 20, 22, of which right now we're 12% to this point. The $94,000, we are 11% to that point already. Um, that many of us in the Fairfield Church of Christ family will show visible growth in the relationship with Christ Jesus by Easter of 2019. That's just a few weeks away. Are you growing up in your faith? Could you tell them about that? They would love to hear that from you. Uh, parents and children and guardians will make attending church a priority over all of their activities. That, you know, we're not going to go to soccer today, dear. We're going to choose to go to church. I don't care what other people say. So you're not on the team. He's more important. Yeah, you'll say something like that, okay? Uh, an increase in teachers of all ages, that we'll have more teachers than we ever needed, that men will feel a call to step up and to become elders. These are their specific prayers. They're praying for you. Here's a few more that I've been praying about, and they're listed in the forms of question. Are all nations and all nationalities welcomed at the Fairfield Church of Christ? Are all nations and all nationalities welcomed at the Fairfield? That's just something I'm praying about. Another question, do we flee to church to hide from our sins, or do we go there to confess them? Are we going through religious rituals when we come to church? As the temples of the living God, are we clean or have we compromised? Would we, like we found in this text, would, would, would God find fruit in our lives? And then this last one, lots of questions within one question. If all of your prayers came true this week, who is it that would meet Jesus for the very first time because you prayed for them? Whose marriage would be restored? Whose great gospel advance might happen that might happen here because you've prayed it to happen? What missionaries might be sent because you prayed that they would go? These are questions that I have that I'm praying about. Here's number four, and we'll move on. Having faith in God means speaking to the mountain and not about it. Speaking to God about the mountain and not about it. If you don't speak to your mountain, your mountain's going to speak to you. Your mountain's going to speak to you. Jesus told the disciples that they could speak to the mountain. We'd love to talk about our problems, and we'd love to talk about our obstacles, but sometimes we never get around to addressing the problem itself. I love the way Eugene Peterson said it in his paraphrase in the Message Bible of Matthew chapter 21, 22 of this particular text we've been reading. Here's how he paraphrased this verse. If you embrace this kingdom, he says, life, and you don't doubt God, you'll not only do minor feats like I did to the fig tree, but you'll also triumph over huge obstacles. This mountain, for instance, you'll tell, go jump in a lake, and it will jump. I love the paraphrased version of that, because it's how we speak to our mountain that is important. The truth is, we talk more about the mountain, and the more we talk about the mountain, the bigger the mountain becomes. It's like what started to be a mountain is now a gigantic mountain, because we just won't stop talking about it. We actually turned our molehill into a mountain. And if you don't speak to your mountain, it will speak to you. It will taunt you, it will follow you, and it will curse you. It will speak this way to you. It will say, look at me. You can't get past me. You'll never be healthy. You'll never be out of debt. You can never kick that habit. So I say try speaking to your mountain directly. You don't have to yell. You just say to your mountain, mountain, that's not, that's it. There's not enough room in here for both of us to live this life right now. And you've got to go, so go jump in a lake. That's a nice way of saying it. Number five, have faith in God means that you are, you're paying more attention to God's power than the size of your mountain. See, the Bible is full of stories of people who face mountains. Sometimes mountains are disguised as difficult people. 
You know what I mean? All you got to do is say, a difficult person, and you're all going, "Mm mm-hmm, yeah. You got somebody in mind who's a difficult person who is your mountain right now. When David was a teenager, he brought food to his brothers who were soldiers on the front lines against the Philistines. And there was a mountain of a man who challenged the Israelites. His name was Goliath. He insulted and taunted the God of Israel and the armies of Israel. And nobody spoke to him. They were all too afraid to speak to Goliath. And everybody spoke about him. And the more they talked about the size of the giant, the more impossible it seemed to defeat him. But little David, (laughs) he spoke to that giant. And he said, you come against me with a sword and a spear, but I've got something better, big guy. I have a name. And this hill isn't big enough for both of us. So I come here against you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. And on this day, the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will knock you down, and I will cut off your ugly head off of your fat body. And I'm doing this so that everyone will know that there is a God in Israel, and the battle will belong to the Lord. Now, mountain, out of my way. And you know the rest of the story. David wasn't focusing on the size of the mountain. He wasn't focusing on the size. He was focusing on the size of his God. The other soldiers would say, look how much bigger Goliath is than me. And David said, look how much smaller he is to our God. The other soldiers would say, Goliath is too big to fight. David said, he's too big not to miss. Are you complaining to God about the size of your mountain? Stop. You should be telling the mountain about the size of your God. And then this last one, when we think about how we have faith in God, it means that God may choose not to move. He may, it means that God may choose to move you rather than move your mountain. Now you can go ahead and speak to your mountain and you can tell it to jump in the lake. But some mountains are mountains by our own making. Like we created the mountain. We threw the stones on top of another stone and we piled it up and we said, wow, I don't know how I'm ever going to get past that. We created it. Our own sin, our own issue, our own thing created the mountain. And now we stand behind it and go, I could never get past that. You were the one who built it. Maybe God needs to move you and not your mountain. Paul was a, a man of faith who moved many mountains, but in Acts chapter 16, he faced a mountain that didn't move. Paul wanted to go to Asia Minor, but he faced a difficult mountain in that case. And God didn't move the mountain, he moved Paul. And Paul, instead of going to Asia Minor, Paul took the gospel to Greece. This is the first time the gospel ever penetrated what we would know to be Europe. And so he takes the gospel to Europe. And those of you who have European family backgrounds should be glad that Paul was moved instead of his mountain being moved. Somewhere back in your ancestry.com, you found somebody who met up with Jesus. And it was because Paul got into Europe. So here's the question we leave with you today. What needs moving? Your mountain? Or you? Who's in the way of the prayer? Is it your stuff? Or is it your heart? Now, here's the thing I understand about what God has done for us God sends His only Son, Jesus, to die for us. And I have to think that as a human, Jesus as a human, He goes, This is absolutely astronomically impossible. The human side of Him. It's the human side of him that went to the garden to pray to say, if there's any way that you can take this cup from passing from me, I'd really like that. That's the human side of him saying that. The God side of him says, I can do this, no problem. Hands tied behind my back. This is not an issue. I can take on the sins of the world, and I can extend grace and mercy to everyone who doesn't deserve it. I can do that. But do I have to do it like this? Do I have to become filth? Do I have to become sin? Do I have to become the stuff that people build their mountains out of? Do I have to do that? And God says, yes, you do. And without question, your will, not mine, be done. I'll follow through. 
and I'll extend my hands and my feet and my head and the sword and the insults. I'll even, while hanging on the cross, look over to my side and say, you're going to be with me in paradise. Even while I'm on the cross, I'm going to be able to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They created mountains. And today, I die for them. I just want you to know that it's been my prayer that it's not your mountain of prayers that you have that I hope will get answered. I hope it's you that gets moved. I hope you find yourself one step closer to the Savior. And I don't know about you, but it's about time some of you just moved. What's keeping you from moving? What mountain, what fear of doubt or shame of rejection or whatever is keeping you from saying yes to Jesus, the Savior? You've got to stop doing that. You've created that mountain. Let God move you. And this invitation is directed to people who without Christ Jesus need to make a decision. Again, we're praying for 55 new members to come and say, I need a, a home, a church, that I can say this is my place where I want to serve, where people are going to keep track of me. I'm going to follow what they want me to do. This is that moment. I'll be right here waiting for anybody who makes that decision. Let's stand as we sing and we close.